privilege of having Will Willman serve with us through June, which is, yes, okay. great news. Yeah. We are very excited that he has agreed to stay for the spring semester with us, and in fact, will be having a slightly reduced schedule at Duke in order to uh, accommodate more time with us. So we have a tremendous gift of six more months of his time. And we will continue in conversation with the DS and the Bishop about the right appointment for Duke Memorial, which will, we assume, be part of the next pastoral appointment cycle. So if you have any questions or thoughts about this, please contact me or any of the members of the committee. We'd be glad to talk with you about it. But in the meantime, we celebrate having Will with us for six months, six more months at least. Thank you. Thank you. Delighted. Um, remind you that next Sunday is when we'll show our gratitude to Duke Memorial uh, and to God for the ministries of this church as we bring our commitments uh, to the financial well-being of the church next Sunday, part of our I Am Grateful emphasis. And now the children will lead us in worship. Isn't it wonderful having a church so full of children uh, today? And I hope there will be a constant rumble of children throughout this service to lead us to God. Can I get this? Oh, perfect. So we're trying an experiment this morning. We have our kinder bell ringers, which are our two, three, and four-year-olds, and they're going to stand up in a minute. But to join them instead of the CD this morning, we're going to use our kindergarten first and second graders to sing the song while they play it. So, wish me luck. <laughs> in your bulletin. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Jesus said, do not stop them. Jesus said, it is to such as these that the reign of God belongs. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the reign of God as a little child will never enter it.
join me in the opening prayer found in your bulletin. Jesus, who received children, we come to you as children. Be with us as we learn to see one another. New eyes, hear one another with new hearts, and treat one another with in a new way. Amen. Fuller Sasser is an active participant in our program. Right after I came here, Fuller wrote me an email complaining that there were no donuts in the worship center. I hope that has never happened again. Any of you that want to write me any complaints, glad to receive them. I probably won't respond to all of them as actively as I responded to Fuller's. Uh, but let us greet one another in signs of God's peace. Our scripture today is read by Catherine, who will... Please join me in the prayer for illumination, which is printed in your bulletin. Living God, by the power of your spirit, let your word ring in our ears. Open our minds and set our hearts afire so that we are transformed from hearers into doers of your word. Amen. The Gospel lesson today comes from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the Gospel. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We'd like for you to be seated and Luke, Patrick Jensen and his family to come forward for baptism. And we'd like all the children to come forward so you can see the baptism. Children will join us down front. And the service of baptism is found on page 39. Oh, good, yeah. No, this is like where we She'll come over. Once again, we're joined by Lisa Cole. Lisa served this church for a decade, and this is about the third baptism since I've been here. Lisa's helped with. She's getting to do something that not many Methodist preachers get to do, and that's see that these teenagers that she guided along are now bringing their children uh, to the church, and so we welcome Lisa with us again. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. This is all God's gift offered to us without price. Who presents Luke Patrick for baptism today? Hillary and Patrick, I ask you these questions. On behalf of the whole church, you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin. Do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior 
put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. And will you nurture Luke in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. And to you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. We do. And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include, include Luke now before you in your care. With, With God's, God's help, we, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We, we surround Luke with the fruit of love, love and forgiveness that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walk in the way that leads to life. And let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that die and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. Amen. Amen. Luke Patrick, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Luke, may the Lord defend you and bless you as you continue to grow in your faith in Jesus Christ and come to know the love of God in such a wonderful and powerful way that your heart will desire to follow him all the days of your life. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. People of God at Duke Memorial, I commend to your love, your care, and instruction our new brother in Christ, Luke Patrick. And if you will, nurture him and be responsible for him and his faith, will you say, we will? Yeah. Welcome. Good morning. All bright and shiny. Here we go. At this time, we will be presenting Bibles to the second grade children in the congregation. Second graders whose names are printed in the bulletin are here in front of us. Parents, you are also invited to come and stand with your child.
Second graders, I hope you will receive these Bibles as a gift, the gift of the Word of God. The Bible is full of stories, poems, songs, and promises. The stories in the Bible belong to us all, and the words of the Bible speak to us all. As you read, study, and understand the Bible, I hope you will see just how much God Today, the Bible you're receiving today is called the Duke Blue Bible. No, I'm sorry, the Deep Blue Bible. <laughs> the first few pages have a guide to understanding your Bible. It has lots of special pictures, maps, and advice for how to begin reading your Bible. I hope you will read these things and bring your Bible with you to church and to Sunday school so we can all talk more about it. I'll call your name so you can receive your Bible. And when your name is called, please take a big step forward. Kathleen Lillian Birch. William Jasper Cooley. Francisco Forrester. Kylie Faith Hoover. Marshall Zinneman Henson Miller. Ellison Catherine White. Ryan Young. Carter. Carter Joseph Kukla. Okay, come. Let us respond with the words printed in your bulletin. We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you and your family and us as you use this Holy Bible in your home, in your Sunday school class, and in our worship. We will learn together and grow in our love for God's Word. Congratulations. Children who have just received your Bibles can do what your elders do, and you can use that Bible to check out and see if the minister's sermon has anything to do with the scripture that it allegedly does business with. So, and today's scripture is from Luke. Now, if you've been here for the Sundays of this fall, you have noted that there's been a kind of theme running through the messages, and it is a theme from the Gospel of Luke. We have noted that one of the earliest and most frequent charges against Jesus is, this one receives sinners, and he eats with them. Jesus is presented as the boundary breaking one who constantly invites and includes. And you expect Jesus to say in response to his critics, Oh, I'm going to redeem these sinners. I'm going to clean them up. I'm going to make them uh, fly right, straighten up. But Jesus simply invites and he includes. Constantly pushing the people of faith out toward the boundaries. And who was the Gospel of Luke written for? It wasn't written for the outsiders, it was written for the insiders. It wasn't, it wasn't meant to be preached to those who are 
foreigners or estranged. It was meant to be preached within the household of God, within the church. So you can see who's being pushed in these stories of the boundary breaking Savior. It, it's people on the inside. Well, this morning we come to a scripture that is dearly beloved by preachers for community Thanksgiving services. It's about the only one we have uh, for community Thanksgiving services with its stress on Thanksgiving, but it fortuitously occurs every fall uh, during the fall stewardship campaign. And you, we can ride this thing in. You know, where are the other nine? Where are the only one has come back to say thanks? Where are the other nine? You know, it, it, it is a story about gratitude, but it is more than that. In the story, Jesus is out in Samaria. He is out beyond the boundaries of faithful Israel. And out there on the boundaries, He meets ten unfortunate people whose illness has pushed them to the boundaries. They are lepers. And when you're a leper, that means not only you're afflicted with a physical illness, but you're considered to be immoral. This illness is the result of some sin in you or your parents. And these lepers cry out to Jesus, Heal us! And Jesus, without saying anything, or doing anything, all he says to them is, go up to the temple and show yourselves to the priest. Show yourselves to the priest. That's what priests do. They stand at the door of the temple. And they make sure that only the right kind of people come in. No unclean people, that is no lepers, are allowed to come in the temple. You go up to the temple, you show yourself to the gatekeepers, the ones who decide who's outside and who's inside. And one returns. They all are miraculously healed. But only one returns. And Jesus says, where are the other nine? Were not ten people healed? And then he says, only one came back and him a foreigner. And that's where this story really hits home. That's the bite in the story. Only one returned and him a foreigner. And you know from the banner and from the banners out front, we're in a stewardship emphasis. And our theme this year is, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. But according to this scripture, the bite here is not, I'm grateful. The bite is, they're grateful. Here, ten people have been healed. Only one is, shows gratitude and thanksgiving to God. And him, a foreigner. Him, an outsider. Gratitude in our culture does seem to be a minority emotion. You probably know that Americans giving to charity is broke down. Uh, it, it, the generosity of Americans seems to be distributed along uh, economic lines. That the most prosperous states in the U.S., Connecticut, New York, Massachusetts, have the lowest percentages of giving to charity. And those states that have been excluded from most of the American giftedness and economic prosperity, Mississippi, Alabama, their citizens give the highest percentage of their incomes to charity. You may not know that the average United Methodist gives a meager 2.3% of annual income to the church. 
You know, biblically and in church history, a tithe, 10%, is the traditional expectation for giving. Methodists give 2.3%. It makes you feel any better. That puts us about fourth from the top in Christians in North America who give. Uh, Roman Catholics down the street give half that much. There, do you feel better? Uh, <laughs> Ten were healed, only one, a meager 10% return and give thanks. But according to statistics, that's a lot better than we're doing. Gratitude, thanksgiving does seem to be a kind of minority emotion. Yeah, but this text is even more difficult than that. It says, in this case, gratitude is found more abundantly among the outsiders than among the insiders. That it is found more among those who do not hold the faith than those who hold the faith. Wow! There does seem to be a paucity of, of gratitude. I'm active in Durham Urban Ministries. Durham Urban Ministries, founded by churches in Durham, feeds uh, the poorest of our citizens, it, uh, the homeless and those in need of food. And I was talking with a board member and I noticed on the board of Durham Urban Ministries a, a name of someone who is not one of my favorite people. He's a professor at a nearby university. He has made a name for himself as being one of the great debunkers of Christianity. Uh, he believes that people who believe the Christian faith are a bunch of saps and he will be glad to explain to you for $29.95 why you're such a sap for believing in the Christian faith. He's made a career of this. And I said, wow, I can't believe he is active in Durham Urban Ministries. I just because I don't approve of him or his scholarship. And the person on the board said, by the way, he is the top single giver every year to Durham Urban Ministries. And he has been so for the past 20 years. Were not 10 people healed? And only one? This non-believer, this foreigner, only one came back to give thanks. It's a jolt. It's a jolt particularly if you're an insider and one of the faithful. I, I tell you, there does seem to be something just built into the Christian faith. That, that makes this faith sometimes have its best traction outside the community of faith. Uh, when I was bishop, district superintendent said to me, you know, Bob has done such a great job at his church, but that church is in a tough part of town. That church has really had a struggle. Bob has got young children. I think we need to move Bob to a less demanding assignment. Uh, let's move him to a suburban church or, or maybe a church in a small town in Alabama. We need to get him out of there. Uh, so I spoke to Bob and I said, the cabinet has smiled on you. Uh, we're now going to deliver you of this tough assignment here in this tough neighborhood and we're going to send you to a less demanding church situation. And Bob said, well, thank you, but Bishop, have you ever heard me preach? I'm not that good a preacher. He said, I'm not like you people that can work something up from nothing and, and you know, be poetic and, and, and all like that. I, I just don't do that. All I can do is just stand up and deliver the straight gospel. And uh, I got to have me a congregation that is receptive just to the straight gospel without any nice rhetorical embellishments. I got to preach to people who are desperate, at a dead end, down on their luck, addicted, impoverished, out of work. I got to have me a congregation that 
can understand the good news without any fancy embellishment. So I have to serve a church like this one because I'm not a good enough preacher to make the gospel credible to people who don't need it. <clears throat> okay. Kate Bowler of this congregation has just published a new book on the prosperity gospel. You may have seen her on CNN last week. She's on the prosperity gospel and these prosperity preachers. And we had Kate teach a small group class here on Sunday morning at Duke Memorial, beginning of the summer. And in that class, uh, Kate read out some of the statements from these prosperity preachers. Joel Osteen and Robert Schuller and all the, and linking the gospel to material prosperity, telling people, you want a new car, you pray for it. God will give you that new car if you have faith and stuff. These ridiculous quotes. And so we were all sitting there feeling good about ourselves. And Kate said, you've never heard preachers at Duke Memorial make stupid statements like this, have you? Huh? No. No, you, you don't hear preachers at Duke Memorial talk a lot about money, do you? Do you? And we said, no, no, we're too sophisticated for that theologically. And then Kate said, that's because you have money. Our preachers don't need to talk about it. People don't come to Duke Memorial to get money because they don't need to ask God for anything that they can solve with their credit card. And suddenly our kind of insider self-righteousness kind of wilted. I think Jesus is doing something like that in this scripture. Patsy and I were invited to a Spanish-speaking congregation outside of Birmingham. And I will never forget that Sunday, we had to participate in the service through an interpreter. It was all in Spanish. And the most memorable part of the service for us is when they came to the prayer request. The pastor came out and said, are there any requests for prayer? And the first thing I noted was all the prayer requests, there weren't any prayer requests for, for themselves. It, they were all prayers of thanksgiving. And every person asked to thank God for their job. Here were people, most of the women in the congregation worked in the horrible conditions of a poultry rending plant nearby. Most of the men worked as day laborers, as ditch diggers and landscapers and heavy construction manual labor. And around the room they said, thank you God. I never thought I'd be in such a great job. I never knew that I could be this fortunate. Thank you for giving me my job. Thank you, God, for my job. Thank you, I work at a great factory with a lot of great people, and I get paid so much for it. Thank you, God, for that job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've been to a lot of Methodist churches. I bet I've been in, what, maybe 10,000 Methodist worship services. And in all those services, I have never heard anybody thank God for a job until that service. And them foreigners came to the end of the service and the pastor did as I'll do at the end of this service, invited anybody who wanted to come uh, affiliate with the church, come forward. This couple came forward and they were from Guatemala. And the pastor received them and all. And then the pastor said, and now you want to join our church. I ask you the standard Methodist questions. Will you support this church with your prayers and your gifts and your service and your witness and your presence? And they said, see, sí, see. Sí. And he said, and by giving to this church 10% of your income. And they said, see, sí, see. Sí. He said, you understand we're Methodist. 
And the bishop can tell you that's required of Methodist. <laughs> we have to give 10% of our income. Would you do that? They said, see, see, see. One year later, that church was closed because the Republican-led legislature of Alabama passed an immigration law. And the pastor, as he was weeping over the phone, said, the majority of people in this congregation are documented. They're here legally. And yet, when the majority leader of the Alabama House stood up and said, if you're an immigrant and you get to the Alabama border, you better keep moving. When he said that, my congregation left. Wow. How does it feel for those of us on the inside? Those of us who've been around here all of our lives, those of us who are in the know, the most faithful ones, for Jesus to marvel. Wow, ten people were giving this amazing gift of God and only one came back and he, an outsider. Only ten percent. Now can you understand why this may or may not be the best scripture text to preach on the eve of a stewardship Sunday? Amen. Come to the prayers of the people. The children are going to lead us in the Lord's Prayer at the end of this. Are there children who will come forward? Why don't you come forward? I think you're to stand here. I'm happy at Duke Memorial. One of the goals of our Christian education program is to prepare children fully to participate in our worship. And so one of the things they've been doing is learning the Lord's Prayer. And now, people of God, let us pray. Lord Jesus, you have so abundantly blessed us. When we pray, we give thanks not only for our blessings, undeserved as they are, but we remember those in difficulty. This morning we remember our sisters and brothers in Bangladesh and India suffering from the natural disaster that befalls them. We also, O oh Lord, pray for our country. We give thanks for our sisters and brothers who have given their lives to the betterment of this country and to government service to working for the common good. We pray for them in this time of need and we pray for our country as it struggles to live out its commitment to democracy and freedom and also for the good society that cares. We ask your blessings upon this congregation as it attempts to find its way into the future. We give thanks for the gift of Duke Memorial and for those who gave and sacrificed and struggled so that we might have this beautiful, expansive church today. And Lord, we pray that you would instill in us a new sense of responsibility for our own day and that you would enable us to be open-handed, generous givers in support of your work. We pray for those in this congregation who are having a tough time this week due to illness of body or mind or soul. Be with them, we pray, and help each of us to feel responsibility to stand with them in their need and in their pain. Be with all those who now lift up in silence 
the secret personal needs they have for your healing and grace? Lord Jesus, the scriptures have told us that you heal, that you invite and you welcome. Give us the grace in our lives as individual believers and as a church to exemplify just some portion, some small percentage of the love and the beneficence you have shown us. This we pray in the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as a grateful people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God, during the offering, if you haven't signed the attendance pad, please sign it and pass it down the aisle so we can connect with you. Let us offer ourselves.
and the faithfulness of families and church members who have loved for generations and who continue to serve in this community in such faithful and powerful and wonderful ways. May you bless this church and your whole church that we each may be that one that comes back and says, we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. During the singing of our final hymn, the hymn is found in the green hymn book. During the singing of our hymn, if there are those who would unite with our church, uh, we invite you forward during the singing of the hymn.
we give thanks that God has called new life into our church. Uh, this is John Oots. He is a uh, teacher at Trinity School, and we welcome him and our fellowship. We've already gotten to know Emily. She's active in our youth fellowship, and John, we welcome you. Uh, Robert Elliott uh, comes to us. Robert has been participating in our life uh, throughout the summer and the end of the fall, and Robert says that he has uh, been to a number of churches in Durham and that Duke Memorial is one of the friendliest and warmest he's attended and uh, we welcome uh, Robert Elliott. And uh, this will come as a shock to a number of you that Patricia Marley, even though she runs the church, uh, has, has never formally become a member of our church until this Sunday. Uh, if you got a pledge card this week, and a letter, you got it because of Patricia uh, getting the work out. She has been wonderful during this time of interim. She is a great leader. Patricia has also been uh, uh, made a lay minister in United Methodist Church through going through a course of study uh, this summer and fall. I told her, you know, if, if you're going to be become a minister in this church, really ought to join the church. So anyway, so Patricia is with us and so we welcome these, uh, this new life among us. I ask you, will you be loyal to this congregation and indeed to the United Methodist Church with your prayers and your gifts and your service and your witness you know, and your tithe? I said that. Little known thing. And now by the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs> 